It's 4.01 and it's Wednesday. So we know where we are and we're all glad that you're here with us. My name is Ann Merchant and I am with the National Academy of Sciences and welcome to our event, which today is titled A Scientist Quest to Cure All SARS Coronaviruses. And I, of course, am joined by... I'm Rick Levert, Program Director of the Science and Entertainment Exchange, which is a program of the National Academy of Sciences. Exactly. And of course, we are very, very happy to have Matt Freeman with us today, um, somebody whom we've known for a long time, who has been our personal guide um, to this pandemic. We were very glad to uh, encourage him onto our stage. He, he's he been somebody that's been on our stage before, but not on our virtual stage because he's been kind of busy the last uh, two years and remains busy, but we've coached him on uh, today and we're glad that he's with us. And of course, one of the things that I always like to do is to refer you to some of the resources at the National Academy of Sciences, where you can find some things that are relevant to today's event. I think we've, of course, said before that we have a lot of resources with respect to um, the coronavirus, but there's a lot of things that we do with respect to vaccines, both COVID related, but more broadly around vaccines. And Sachi Haisi has already dropped that link into the chat. So you can follow that and find out more from what, you've, um, what you can learn from the Academy. Um, and, and of course, as I always say, we know that the big reports from the institution are not for everybody. And we, of course, one of the reasons you're here is that you like to see it digested into slightly different form. And that's the reason that the Science and Entertainment Exchange exists. And Rick, I'll pass it to you at this point, as I always do, to explain a little bit more about the exchange. That's right. So if you're a writer, producer, director, actor, storyteller in any format, and you have a question about science, you can call us. We'll connect you with an expert like Matt. Uh, to answer all of your questions about science. By the way, Matt, thank you for saving me. Uh, we were in the prep right before this, and he's like, oh, the image behind you is not a coronavirus. So I just, now I, this is why we have uh, consultants like Matt. We've done over 3,400 since our launch in 2008. Um, and we've done tons and tons and tons of projects in which uh, you know people like to pretend to punch through walls and have uh, savior complexes. Also documentary films. Uh, graphic novels, video games. So if you are a STEM professional and you're just learning about the work that we do, please, please uh, put up your hand and volunteer. We would love to connect you to storytellers. Um, so if you would like to find a recording of this show later this week, uh, you can go to the Exchange's website or subscribe to the Science and Entertainment Exchange on YouTube, and then you will have all of our programming as it drops uh, after the live events. I want to thank today's sponsors, or today's sponsor in particular, Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Also, we get major funding from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, without whose support we definitely wouldn't exist, so thank you. And thank you to all of our individual supporters, like many of you who donated today. Thank you. That goes directly back into the program when you do. I want to thank Courtney Sloan, Sachi Gerben, Jeff Fishman, Amechi Lukpabi, and also uh, and everybody on the team for tech producing. Thank you. We couldn't do this without you. Um, so the event structure today, we have a spectacular speaker um, who put me off sharing nachos many years ago, um, even before this pandemic time. Um, and if at any time during his talk, you have a question, you can put it down here. Uh, in the Q and A, uh, not the chat. We don't do, we don't use chat. We just use the Q and A. And when Matt is ready, he will call for me, and then I will come back and I will be the voice of all of your questions. We'll get to as many as we possibly can. For this event, we also have a VIP Q and A. So if you uh, if you donated any amount uh, uh, for this week's event, you should have gotten a link. Uh, if you didn't get a link, please uh, uh, contact Sachi, and she will get you the link. Um, if you are an exchange supporter also, which means you should have gotten a little coin or been asked if you want a coin, um, we will, uh, you should also have access to the VIP Q&A. So ask Sachi for the link if you did not get it. Um, my rabbit hole this week, the thing that is we researched this event just caught my attention and I couldn't let it go, is the year 536. Now, the last two years have been kind of tumultuous for everybody. The year 536 is widely regarded as the worst year in human history uh, to be alive. It sparked a dec uh, the worst decade of the Dark Ages, plague, crop failures, starvation. Thanks a lot, Iceland, for letting that volcano erupt and ruining the next decade. So if you're, uh, if you're interested in thinking, I don't know, I guess it could have been worse, uh, 
536. Uh, back to you, Anne. And I did not know that. So I'm glad that your rabbit hole has served to make me feel better about the last two years. So thank you very much. Um, my rabbit hole made me feel better about more recent times. So Peggy Hamburg, who um, is a member of the National Academy of Medicine, has actually been on our stage and uh, it most recently has been the Foreign Secretary of the National Academy of Medicine, was recently awarded AAAS's Abelson Prize, which recognizes uh, sustained exceptional contributions to advancing science. Peggy is a one wonderful human being, um, an exceptional science as the award recognizes and, and has really done a lot in the past two years um, to really make people aware of what they can do to keep themselves and others safe during the pandemic. So congratulations to Peggy. And as uh, I see, Sachi has dropped that link into the chat. Um, but as I said at the top of this, we are really happy to have Matt with us. Uh, one of the things that he has done for me is that in 2019, we hosted an event where Matt was one of our speakers and his lab is devoted to the study of coronaviruses. This is of course predates the pandemic. And he gave a talk that made people aware that we should be thinking about the possibility of a pandemic that might originate with a coronavirus. I was his living show and tell model for the personal protective gear that he uses in his laboratory to demonstrate the severity of many coronaviruses because I was, you know, head to toe um, dressed in a very secure kind of suit with a ventilator attached. And so the picture that I have used on Zoom since that event <laughs> is me in that PPE. And so he gifted me with that, with that picture um, many years ago, but also with, um, with a lot of information that took us into the pandemic that was really useful. So um, we were especially prescient to ask Matt onto our stage then. It was not the first time that we had had him as a, an expert um, as part of the work that we've done at the exchange, but we're really fortunate to have him back again here today. But on a more optimistic note, because the work he's doing now is to really look at how we can go forward from the place that we now sit to think about vaccines um, from a place that keeps us safe uh, in case we have to think about other coronaviruses. So Matt, I, we're gonna ask you to turn on your camera. Rick and I are going to go away and we're going to give the stage to you because you are all the reason that we are here. So thank you again for being here and we're looking forward to listening to another one of your talks. Well, thank you very much for having me. Um, let me just get these up. Um, uh, and I'm happy to come and talk. I've, uh, I, I do, I love what the Science and Entertainment Exchange does. Um, I've had a ball working with them over the years and talking to a bunch of writers and filmmakers um, and entertainers over, over the years. I, I looked back, I think it was 2014 when I first started um, and emailed them through the website. So if there's anybody listening that uh, works on any kind of science field and, and is, uh, wants to talk to kind of really interesting people along the way, um, please go to the website and uh, drop your name in and your information. Um, but today, as I'm gonna give you a little bit of a background on where we are with SARS uh, coronavirus 2 and COVID-19. Um, uh, and the weird thing about this whole outbreak for us in my lab is that we've been working on this for a long time. And so my uh, background in, in starting this started in um, in 2004, when I started uh, in my postdoc in, in North Carolina, starting to work on SARS coronavirus 1, which had just emerged in 2002. Um, and then when I started my lab here at University of Maryland in 2009, we had still worked on SARS coronavirus 1. When uh, another coronavirus emerged in 2012, MERS coronavirus, we started working on that virus as well, using all the tools and technology we used for the original SARS um, uh, to study that virus. And then now with SARS coronavirus 2, we were, you know, remarkably surprised that this virus uh, emerged, but really kind of the whole field, it wasn't just me, but the whole field predicted that these viruses were out there and they could jump into humans. And that um, has certainly been what we've seen. So I just wanna give you a little bit of intro of kind of status of where we are during this uh, pandemic, um, and then really talk about what the future of this is gonna hold, at least um, uh, what we think, at least for the therapeutic side, um, especially vaccines. And so this is just taken um, from yesterday. Uh, we have now crossed over the 6 million death mark around the world for COVID-19 cases, um, certainly an underestimate, uh, with almost 450 million cases worldwide um, over the last two years. In the U.S., we're, all, we're uh, over 960,000 deaths, and 
79 million cases. Uh, at the beginning of this outbreak, I certainly did not predict um, we would be any the number of uh, cases and exposures that we've had um, so far. The, one of the things I, I, I'd like to point out too is that early on in this pandemic, um, there's a scientist named Nancy Messonnier, uh, who was a scientist at the CDC. She had a, um, the CDC was doing uh, press releases basically and, and phone call uh, to the press early on in the pandemic. Um, and this kind of prescient line in, in February 26th of 2020 was hers, which said, I understand this whole situation may seem overwhelming and that disruption may, to everyday life may be severe. Um, this was when we only had a, a handful of cases in the United States. Uh, there was certainly cases in China and, and growing around the world, but um, this foresight really uh, prepared, I think, uh, for people who are listening the, to what we would be seeing uh, now. Um, and uh, for some of that, I hope we would listen better and prepare a little sooner, but um, we certainly have done a remarkable amount of work over time. So this is the virus that we're uh, all worried about now in the world. Um, on the right is a cartoon uh, of what this looks like. On the left is an electromicrograph of what this virus looks like under an electron microscope. Um, the, this family, family of viruses are called coronaviruses. Corona is uh, Latin for crown. And so the very first images of these viruses under the electron microscope showed this kind of crown or halo around this virus, and that's where it got its name. Um, the important part of this for therapeutics and for vaccines especially is that the outside of the virus is studded by these red dots on the right-hand side, and these are essentially like lollipops. Um, and that is what attaches to our cells, the spike protein, and that's what all of the vaccines that we um, hopefully have been taken are protecting us against. So they're the spike protein is made in various ways, either by mRNA or by protein um, injection of, in the vaccines. And that is what our antibodies are really trying to, to, to detect and protect us from, is the, is the way that the spike protein binds the cells, we can get in the way by these antibodies. Um, and so as we've all heard it, and you know, I think the joke now is that before, uh, before 2020, there was only you know, a couple dozen coronavirus experts in the United States um, now there are many of us and, and uh, many of you that have way much more expertise in coronaviruses than the general population did um, in 2019. And one of the things that's been kind of remarkable is, is, is watching people learn and watch people understand this virus, both in labs, but also in the community. Um, but one of the things that's been a really problematic part of this for um, therapeutics is this, the way the virus replicates and the way it's evolved over time. And so um, on the left-hand side, again, is the, uh, the spike protein on the surface of our cells. And what happens is the virus replicates. It's kind of like this uh, movie Multiplicity, which I loved when I was a kid, where it was a copy of a copy of a copy. And you got kind of more problems and more mutations over time. That's essentially exactly what's happening to SARS, um, where the more people it goes through and, rep and, and, and replicates from and transmits from person to person, the more mutations you get on the surface of this virus. And so this is really important for vaccines because so this is what the virus looks like now. All these, um, the numbers here and the, the lines are pointing to mutant amino acids, mutant parts of this spike protein as it's presented on the virus. And the problem with all of this is that that's what the vaccines are directed to. They're directed to the one without the mutations, not the one with the mutations. And as we get more and more mutations, we get away from what the vaccines are really targeting. Um, the, same, for the same reason we have to get flu vaccines every year and they have to be updated is because uh, we, there's mutations of the virus over time as it goes through people. Um, and one of the kind of really important things to understand is the more people that the virus infects, the more chance of mutations can occur. Um, and so coronaviruses actually don't mutate that much unless they have some pressure on them. And in context of what we're doing now, what we see is that people are, you know, are, uh, have antibodies after vaccination or being infected. And when they then get exposed and the virus can take hold a little bit, um, there's mutations that occur as the virus replicates that get around your antibodies in your body. And so that's really what we're seeing, what's driving all these variants that we, um, that we know of. And so if we look at all the variants over time, um, they get these Greek names now from the WHO, which certainly helps us talk about them a little bit. Um, we had the original virus, um, the OG SARS-2 in early 2020. Um, and there really wasn't much that was detected in the variant uh, side of this, the mutants, um, until really late, 2020. Part of it was weren't really a lot of sequencing wasn't done through so we looking, but the other part was that um, uh, there wasn't a lot of pressure on the virus to to mutate. It was replicating and spreading incredibly fast around the population around the world, 
and there wasn't much um, need for it to replicate in a sense, and, uh, for it to mutate. But as it went through time and it started seeing more immunocompromised, more uh, seropositive people, so because of vaccination or previous infection, it now started mutating. We had this alpha variant, there's a beta and a gamma variant as well, which didn't take off really widely. Um, uh, we have delta, which certainly took off in late 2020 or 2021, excuse me. And then Omicron, which has really been this really dramatic rise in cases over uh, late 2021 and into 2022. Um, and what we can understand about these variants is that um, they really have started driving more and more evasion of antibodies. Um, and these mutations in the spike, as well as other parts of the genome, really affect it the way it transmits, the way it gets around um, our antibodies and our vaccines. Um, and this is really what we're looking at now. We're trying to make basically future-proof drugs and future-proof uh, vaccines. So there's a whole host of therapeutics. Um, uh, that have been start that have been certainly approved and and so on the top here is the vaccines. Uh, we all know about the mRNA vaccines for Pfizer and Moderna. They have been exceptionally uh, strong vaccines. Um, I don't think there there isn't anyone that I know of that when these mRNA vaccines uh, were proposed and approved and, and started to be worked on in early 2020 um, for SARS coronavirus two protection that would have predicted that they worked as well as they did. Uh, maybe only the CEO of Moderna and Pfizer, but outside of that, no one else. Um, they've been remarkable vaccines, and I think it's a, a testament to the basic science that drove them early on, but also to the um, to the the scientists, the preclinical scientists, uh, and the clinical trial experts that really uh, were able to rapidly develop these vaccines and then test them in, in humans. Um, the other vaccines here, the AstraZeneca and the Johnson Johnson vaccine, are these vector vaccines. Um, based on uh, adenoviruses that normally give us a cold, they engineer them so they they can only replicate in our in our in our cells and make more of the spike protein that's in there that are engineered in, but not more of the virus. Um, they have been remarkably good as well, uh, um, and as single doses, the J and J vaccine has certainly been used around the United States for a lot of populations. Um, the next phase of this is certainly going to be protein-based vaccines. Uh, which are not yet approved in the US. Novavax is one of the vaccines that we've worked on um, in the lab with Novavax directly through all their preclinical and then clinical trial work. Um, that hopefully will be approved soon. It'd be really nice if it was. Uh, it's really a remarkably potent vaccine. Um, and we think it has a lot of future proof uh, potential in the uh, later. Um, the, on the antibody side, there was very early work on the one from Regeneron, really developing uh, rapid response monoclonal antibodies. Um, as well as from AstraZeneca and, and Veer uh, and, and Eli Lilly. So they all kind of came out in the early phase. Regeneron was first, certainly the first one that came out and was for EOA approval. As the variants have evolved and we've gotten now to Omicron, some of them don't work anymore. So the monoclonal antibodies are basically um, vaccine in a tube that just makes gives you the antibodies that uh, one of the antibodies that you normally would get when you um, get vaccinated. And if the mutations in the spike are in places that the, where the antibodies bind, they don't bind anymore, then they don't work. And so the Regeneron, um, uh, uh, Regenco, their, their combination uh, monoclonal doesn't work anymore because it doesn't bind to Omicron. A couple of the Eli Lilly antibodies don't work anymore either, but there's now a whole new range of these antibodies from Beer, AstraZeneca, and a new one from Eli Lilly that are now, that are still potent and they work against multiple, multiple variants. Um, we hope they work in the future. Um, on the drug side, I won't go into it too much, but there are only a handful of drugs and we are working on really broad antivirals that will protect us into the future for the viruses that we know of now um, in the coronavirus lineages, but also the viruses that we don't even know exist um, in the future. And so we really want to make drugs and vaccines and antibodies that will be future-proof and they will protect us from the variants that are now um, and also to be put on the shelf so that once COVID-19 wanes and we all get back to um, you know, somewhat normal lives, uh, the, they will be there for the next coronavirus to emerge. And um, after three coronaviruses in, um, in 17 years, from 2003 and, and, and 2019, when, um, when SARS coronavirus 2 emerged, the possibility of there being future ones is certainly high. And so um, the, one of the ways, the, the basic way that all these vaccines work, as I said, is by um, they make antibodies in our body. They protect us by binding to the virus, just shown here in this cartoon. Um, and then that binding allows it to be clear rapidly and not infect our cells, which is the whole idea behind these vaccines um, and the way they work. 
And so what the ways that we want to make them better in the future is basically, you know, using that same technologies that we have, but there's new ways of doing it. So um, uh, one of the, there's a, a couple different ways that, that are being proposed now that we're working on in the lab and, and um, we're working with other people on too. And so one way is to take the mRNA vaccine. So say the, um, the blue squiggle here is the spike protein for what we know of in early 2020, the original Wuhan 1 strain. Um, and so we know all these other variants now. And so what you can do is you can make an mRNA vaccine that expresses um, pieces of, of all of the variant spikes or all of the variant spikes together. And so you don't just get one spike in your vaccine, you get a multitude of them. And these have been used in the lab already, and they're in preclinical studies in, in animals, showing they really do protect really broadly against all the variants that we know of, um, and even wider into uh, the original SARS coronavirus 1 uh, virus, and potentially into MERS as well. And so the idea is to make these broad vaccines that really cover all the, all the, the coronaviruses that we can, uh, we can study in the lab. One of the other ways that we're working on too is looking at these things called adjuvants. So these are basically chemicals that <clears throat> excuse me, get mixed in with vaccines all the time. Um, they're in most of our, our uh, vaccines that we all get normally, um, but they enhance the way that the, the, the body responds to the protein or the mRNA that's there. And so um, we've been able to show in the lab that if you mix these adjuvants with, um, with the current vaccines, you actually make them uh, have broader coverage and work better. And so you may not need a new vaccine, you may just need one that works better and, and, um, and makes your body respond differently to the current vaccine. And so um, that's certainly one way to enhance protection for things that are already approved. And then the third way is really looking at long lasting immunity. Um, and while we all talk about antibodies and all these um, uh, in all this work, we really are driving um, another part of the immune response, this, this uh, T cell response it's called. And so, the T cell response is much long living. Uh, it can look at different parts of the protein or the virus than just the spike alone. And what is being done now is trying to engineer vaccines so they induce much longer lasting T cell and B cell responses. So uh, maybe you don't need a, a, a vaccine every year. Maybe we need it every couple of years because you know, the longevity and the um, heightened response is much better. And so all of these kind of techniques and tools are being tested in the lab and in, in, um, in studies now to see which one of these is going to work. And it may actually be a combination of these effects that uh, will be used in the future. And so I'll end with this kind of slide here where um, when I was a kid growing up, I loved movies. We used to go to movies every Saturday um, uh, growing up from when I was a little kid all the way through when I left for college. Um, I really miss going to movies. I hope we can go to movies in the theater very soon and I feel comfortable doing it. Um, but you know, this is my smattering of kind of virus like uh, movies where there's or shows where there's viruses in there. And, and um, I think that it's kind of remarkable that a lot of the things in these movies uh, have gotten, they've gotten right, some a lot wrong, but a lot of it has been right about the way that viruses spread and things we should be worried about. Like if you watch Contagion and you can see the virus spreading from animals to humans at the end. Um, and of course, then Gwyneth Paltrow dies. But um, the ability for us to kind of use entertainment and, and film and TV to, um, bring about a kind of global consciousness of what we should be worried about, I think is pretty um, intriguing. And I think is one of the really good things that the uh, science exchange does. Um, so uh, uh, if anyone has um, uh, any interest in all of these uh, virus movies or pathogen movies or kind of outbreak version of things, um, these are my favorites up here. Uh, so I suggest you uh, go take a look. Okay, I'm gonna end there and uh, happy to take any questions, thanks. All right, we got lots of questions. Keep them coming, everybody. Uh, I will be uh, checking the feed uh, rigorously as uh, as Matt and I continue. So, Matt, um, I think uh, Adrian. I'm going to start with Adrian's question, which is not a fair question to ask you. I'm going to ask it anyway, uh, and add a little uh, caveat on there as well. Adrian asks, "When will COVID end?" And I would just say, if you could sort of project out some what you think the most likely scenario over the next two to five years will be in the COVID story. Okay, so I, Yogi Berra says not to make predict predictions, especially again about the future. But um, uh, I think so. I think what we've seen so far is that as the virus spread, um, it was certainly hitting unvaccinated and unprotected people around the world very quickly, and that. We've seen waves of this over time, starting in big cities, going to smaller cities as the virus spread. Um, that's certainly what we saw in the last two years. Um, 
there's been a big discussion about it, the virus becoming endemic and endemicity, basically meaning that the ability for the virus to cause distress and damage will um, be reduced as we go. Uh, we're not there yet. Um, there are cases are rising in places around the world now. UK is having a rise in cases. Germany, uh, much of Europe is seeing rises. Um, we're not we're not anywhere near the end of this yet. Um, two to five years from now, I think you know on the on the early side of that, on the two year side from now, I sure hope that we are in a much more stable place. That we're not seeing these waves, where the waves are going to be smaller. Um, but we thought that after Delta and Omicron came and certainly surprised everyone in, that I know of in, that works in these viruses, that they would come at, at such a rate and such a speed. And so um, I, I think what we certainly need is more people vaccinated. Um, it'll, people who aren't vaccinated will get infected multiple times and we'll see this, this spread. And I think that what we certainly will, um, what we certainly will see are, are cases continue. Um, and I think we'll see the, that there will be pockets in the world where we'll see large spikes um, and hopefully other places in the world where it'll be contained. And um, unfortunately, you know, vaccines aren't evenly distributed and we will see places that are, don't have vaccines uh, in their arms right now to be really hit hard over the next several years. So are there any critical metrics for you that you look at for when you'll feel comfortable, say, maskless in a movie theater if you've been, if you're up to date on your vaccinations? So it's good. So, I mean, I, I'll give the bias that we, you know, I have two little kids. Uh, I'm, I'm a 12 and a nine-year-old. Um, my wife's a physician at, at Hopkins. Uh, and we still mask. Um, masks were just last week were removed in, in I'm in Baltimore, in, in Baltimore school systems, and even at my university here. Um, uh, I'm not there yet. I, I certainly want to see what cases go. And um, we're really good in Baltimore. Our case numbers are very low uh, in, in across Maryland and our vaccine numbers are pretty high, but I'm still not there yet. I, it doesn't bother me to wear a mask. Um, I would love to, you know, in the next you know, month or so to really get back out and go to movies and go to restaurants. And um, I think for me, we're just watching these numbers to see as masks are removed, uh, do case numbers go back up? Um, and if they don't, then I feel really good about uh, kind of getting back out there. We have two questions around long COVID. I'm going to start with Andrews, which is essentially just wanting to know what are what are the symptoms, and I'm I'm going to add to that too. Like, what do you have a sense of how how often people get long COVID in different scenarios? You know, vaccinated, unvaccinated, after getting COVID. So well, I find long COVID to be fascinating. And I think that the, um, it's scary at the same time. Um, uh, the numbers are remarkably scary to me. So the numbers are basically somewhere around 30% of people uh, upwards of six months after they're infected still have some residual thing, whether it's not be, it's smell, whether it's memory, whether it's um, you know, aches and pains or, or um, malaise of tiredness, the, all, they're, it's a much, it's a very broad spectrum of, of symptoms, which I think is going to be the problem in studying long COVID. Um, the, the, the major drivers of it seem to be inflammation at some level. So we have a very pathogenic virus that in, that we have not seen before. So it causes a lot of inflammation in our lungs and our body. Um, in certain people, it spreads to other organs and you're getting a much more dramatic effect than you do um, in other people. Uh, we don't yet know why that is. It, the long COVID, the idea is that even in, it's much more, it potentially is more severe in people who get more severe disease. Um, but even in mild, mild symptoms where someone, you know, there's a lot of reports of where people have very mild illness. They have maybe a stuffy nose or runny nose for a couple of days and they, you know, test out and they're fine and it's negative. Um, they, and they still have kind of unresolved conditions later. And so, um, we don't really know the drivers of it. Certainly genetics plays a role in this. Um, previous immune level and um, uh, being immunocompromised plays a role in that as well. Uh, potentially diabetes, obesity, any kind of level of things that make immunocompromised. But I think this is something we're gonna be dealing with for a long time. And um, uh, we've, in our lab, we've, um, we've studied this to look in neurons of humans, and at least in the lab. And we have signs that in, at least in neurons in a Petri dish, they look like Alzheimer's-like phenotypes when you infect them with virus. Now, you know, in humans, 
is that true or not? In some levels, we have we've uh, in groups here we've collaborated with we've done um, studies in brains of of autopsy cases, and they we see some of the same markers that you see in you know severe neurodegeneration. So it's something we're certainly worried about, and it's why I think the idea that you don't that you know you don't vaccinate kids or you don't have to get vaccinated because it's not a bad virus is crazy to me because even getting infected can leave you with these symptoms for a long time, um, and it's and we don't really have. Uh, any treatment for any of those things yet? Um, how does how does one know if they have long COVID? Is there like a is there a test versus you know other aches and pains or problems around? I'm not I'm not, I'm not trying to uh, diminish people who have long yeah. COVID. I'm sure they do have it, but how does one know? Is is there a way of of confirming a case? Yeah, so it's it's a pretty broad spectrum of illness. So I mean, I think it's it's certainly linked to. Being infected, you know, having having validated infection by PCR or antigen positivity, um, but it's having a lot of these longer term issues. Whether it's shortness of breath, so the obviously the virus is a respiratory virus, it causes a lot of damage in the lungs, so you can have fibrosis. Um, uh, you know, like a uh, you know a couple of day pack smoker afterward. Um, you can have neurological issues that affect memory. Um, certainly, all of the smelling and taste. Uh, issues that everyone had reported early on uh, is it can last a long time. And there's um, anosmic people who they, you know, things smell weird or bad for a very long time after infection. Um, and so I think all of this smattering of, of things is, is part of this long COVID syndrome that, again, we really don't yet understand kind of the breadth of this uh, across the population. So uh, I think you answered this, but I'm just going to make sure and underline it uh, while we're on the topic of long COVID. Agnes asks about cures for long COVID, um, whether the vaccine helps, whether there are other viable therapies out there. Yeah, so um, we don't necessarily have a cure yet, but there are, there are definitely studies where people have gotten doses of either monoclonal antibodies or convalescent sera, so basically, you know, someone else's antibodies, um, and that has resolved symptoms. And there's, there's certainly, there's a lot of case studies now showing that in some people that certainly works. Uh, so, that, that should be an option for people who, um, at least that's the only option at the moment for people who have long COVID for um, resolution of symptoms. It doesn't work for everybody, but there are, there's, a, there's a good number of cases now where it has resolved. And the idea there is, is you're, um, you're somewhat cleaning up the residual virus or viral proteins that are causing inflammation in your body. And that um, by getting extra antibodies, you can clear those proteins or, or the residual virus that isn't growing, but it's kind of still kind of essentially stuck in your immune response and, and triggering this response for a long time. So it looks like it's an immune issue, um, but we, uh, how to uh, officially cure it and get it out is, is, and resolve it is, you know, still up for uh, debate and uh, a lot of work being done. Okay, so I believe, I believe these two questions are related, forgive me if they're not. Uh, Carla wants to know why SARS-2 will be endemic versus SARS-1 or MERS, and Bill wants to know, uh, why COVID, uh, you know, why this version went pandemic, whereas other SARS uh, outbreaks did not. Yeah, great. So um, I, I will tell you what I think, what we think the answer is. Um, uh, and so one of the kind of remarkable things from a virology standpoint, I know it's you know, COVID is a terrible disease, but um, is that for SARS-CoV-1, when you got infected with it, um, so first SARS-CoV-1 emerged in 2002, uh, 2003, it infected around 8,000 people and killed around 10%. So much more lethal than SARS coronavirus 2, um, which is somewhere around you know, 0.1% to 1%. Um, the, um, everyone who was infected with SARS coronavirus 1 um, essentially got symptoms within the first 24 hours of being, of being infected. And so you had some idea that you were positive and you were, it's something, and you were sick. And so those people either, once we realized, the, the, the scientists realized that it was a respiratory virus and that it was transmitted in the air, um, uh, they either quarantined at home or they went to the hospital because they got really sick in the ICU and they were under droplet precautions. And so that limited the amount of transmission that could occur uh, because everyone was in, who had symptoms once they were very early stage infected. Um, uh, MERS, which emerged in 2012, it, is very lethal. It's only infected around 4,000 people that we know of, 2012. So not transmitted very well, but it's about 30, 35% lethal. So much hotter than what we know of, but it doesn't transmit very well. 
Um, it's still in the wild. There's still cases of MERS. It jumps from camels to humans, mostly in the Middle East, um, or all in the Middle East at the moment. And, um, but it doesn't transmit from person to person incredibly well. So uh, that's the limitation there. For SARS coronavirus 2, the reason it really has this dramatic spread is it looks like a seasonal cold coronavirus, which we get every winter. There's four other ones. Um, and when we get infected, we don't know we're positive. And we're shedding virus before we have symptoms. And so you're traveling around, you're flying, you're doing everything else. Um, uh, and you're shedding virus without knowing that you are infecting people around you. And so that's what's really driven the dramatic difference between SARS-1 and SARS-2 is this timing and transmissibility of the virus of, of infection. Um, so Bill's asking specifically about uh, the full range of coronaviruses in, in bats, but I'm gonna just like go all the way to talk about uh, the animal kingdom and, and how we, you know, do, do you have a sense of, or does, does humanity have a sense of the actual full range of coronaviruses? Oh, certainly not. So the, so the bat coronaviruses have been studied, you know, ever since SARS-1 was identified that bats were the, um, were the parent virus of, of it was, um, in, in, I think it was identified right around 2004 or so that it was bats, 2003, 2004, um, uh, that were living in the, in the caves outside of Hong Kong uh, where it was first identified. The, since then, people have been sampling bats all over the world and finding coronaviruses every place they went. Um, we did a study in Maryland where we uh, swabbed and took fecal samples from bats in Western Maryland, and we identified a novel coronavirus, not in the same lineage as, as SARS, SARS coronaviruses. It was a different lineage. Um, no evidence that it jumped to people, but they are there. Um, when you go outside of bats, there are coronaviruses in every species of animal that you can find. There's a beluga whale coronavirus. There's a hedgehog coronavirus, chipmunk coronavirus. Um, uh, what we're seeing now, which is a little, to take a, a little different, what we're seeing now for SARS-2 is that um, there are animals in the wild that can be infected with SARS-2 and they're getting basically reverse zoonotic infections. So zoonotic is where it jumps from animals to humans. Um, there's uh, uh, reverse zoonosis where it goes from humans to animals. And we think that the, uh, there's, there's multiple studies out now showing deer in the US can be, are, are positive uh, with SARS-2. There's a, a giant outbreak of mink uh, that were positive in, in Europe um, that were eventually culled because there was mink to human, there was human to mink and then mink to human in the same farms. So there's a lot of virus out there that we don't know and, and haven't looked. And um, there's still a lot to discover. Um, not super good at other languages, but uh, I believe we have someone uh, who is Greek who is asking the question, about a uh, spouse's upcoming pre uh, pregnancy. Um, uh, in this person's case, they say they, uh, the, the, their spouse has been triple vaccinated by Pfizer. But just generally, what would you advise for anybody who is pregnant, looking to become pregnant, um, you know, looking to grow their family in this time? I mean, the best thing you can do is get vaccinated. Um... Uh, and it sounds like if this person is triple vaccinated, they are as protected right now as you could be. Um, uh, if you are certainly in an area where there are an, a large outbreak of cases, then to mask and to distance like we've been doing, you know, for the last two years, um, so that you can protect, you know, you and your, you know, your child or soon to be child with, from getting sick. Um, there's very little transmission from human to fetus that, you know, woman to fetus that we, that we know of. Um, but it's still much better not to get infected if you can. Um, and vaccines are, and, and other uh, masking and other social distancing measures are, you know, the best ways that we know of doing it. So I'm not familiar with the term that Dennis is using. You may be uh, affinity maturation. Does that, is that, okay. So sure. he's asking, Dennis is asking about uh, the vaccination schedule of MNR, mRNA vaccines versus for the ma affinity maturation of antibodies versus uh, natural infection? So um, the short version, so affinity maturation is basically what your immune response does after you get vaccinated or exposed to anything. So you get antibodies made right away. Um, and then you have memory cells, memory B cells that, make, that, are, that are the ones that have made or, or version of the ones that have made the antibodies. And so over time, they mutate. And they start, they basically take what you, the, the antibody gene that you, that they have in them and they start making little mutations in them. So the next time they see the pathogen, in this case, SARS-2, 
um, they have kind of a, a, a plethora of little versions of the ones that work better, um, potentially work better. And so this is this maturation side of it. Um, it's it, the maturation side, it, it's the, the biology behind this is really interesting for SARS because um, the vaccination schedule, as we've been doing it, which is, you know, everyone knows for Moderna and Pfizer was either three weeks or four weeks between your first dose and your second dose. Um, you get minimal time for maturation, but what happens there for the second dose is you get a really big peak of antibody because of the second vaccination. Um, the short answer is we don't have the, the, we don't know the best timing between doses to allow for this maturation to occur. Um, we don't know exactly when the best time is, you know, if you wanted to time it from being infected either before or after vaccination, I think you should want it after because you don't want to get sick with the virus anyway. Um, but this maturation process goes on and on in all of us all the time, um, no matter the vaccine or, or pathogen. And um, uh, the idea is that maybe over time, as we go longer and we get boosted, you know, once a year or doses further, this maturation process will be enhanced because you're exposed less and less and you have the vaccines that we are triggering different responses. Um, so I don't know if I've answered this question too much, but I think that this maturation side is certainly something that, every, that people are working on and is important to understand in the vaccination schedule and um, how we're gonna respond in the future. Yeah, Dennis, feel free to ask a follow-on in the q and I'll keep an eye out. Um, so Bill is asking a question I think a lot of us relate to, which is, um, Matt, what mask are you wearing? And also <laughs> finding the real deal for kids versus stuff that may or may not be the real deal for kids. So this is what I wear. I'm gonna make it fun. So I wear a rainbow mask every day. This is a KN95. Um, and so I've, we've been wearing them in my house for a long time. Um, and uh, I certainly wore cloth masks early on and then, but we've, we've switched to K95s uh, since then, um, since, you know, probably early last year. The, uh, for kids, so my kids wear kid K95s. Um, I, I, I know there's numbers you can look on the side and, and I'm not an expert in which masks to tell somebody to pick off Amazon. Um, but we, we order regular K95 kid sized over Amazon and, and they have been really fine and have not got sick since um, you know, this emerged. Um, the trick, the really important thing for masks is they are fit well. So, you know, you can't have a big adult mask on a kid because their face is the right size and you need to have good, you know, good contact around the mask. That's really the key part for when you're looking at sizing and, and masks. Um, but I certainly just wear a K95 and, um, uh, you know, they're not, I find them to be pretty comfortable and, you know, don't mind wearing them all around all the time. Um, so Cindy wants to know about uh, past vaccines, uh, safety and performance, and what it's taught us about where we are with this, this vaccine's safety and performance. So I know that there's, there's a huge amount of concern about the safety of mRNA vaccines. I get it. Um, they have never been in humans, you know, approved in humans before. Um, and so I, 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 it's okay to have skepticism there. I think it's, it's important to understand what we know and we don't know about these vaccines. Um, I will say, if you look at all of the safety data for the mRNA vaccines that have come out both at, you know, in the US and the FDA and EUA filings, as well as other countries, um, they're remarkably safe. Uh, it is, it is um, they have very little um, long-term effects. I think a lot of people like I did, after one, one or two doses, you had a, a response for about a day where you got a fever or you had aches and pains. I was fine after the first one, I thought everybody was a whim. And they were just complaining. The second one totally knocked me on my butt for 24 hours. Um, uh, but the third, when I got my booster dose, I was fine. Um, just had you know, a little, and, and everybody responds differently. There's no way to know. Um, but outside of that, there's, there's very little long-term effects, uh, you know, adverse effects on these vaccines. Um, do some people have adverse responses? They do, but it's a, it's a huge minority. The percentages are very small of real adverse effects to many of these mRNA vaccines. Um, uh, the new one that's coming, the Novavax vaccine is a protein-based vaccine. It's approved in, I think, 37 countries now, not in the US yet, hopefully soon. Um, my shout out to Novavax. They've been, we've been working with them. So uh, we worked with them for MERS and now for SARS-2. Uh, it's a protein-based vaccine, so not mRNA. So if someone is out there that's not vaccinated and is worried about the mRNA side of it, um, uh, in, in the, in, and you're in the US, hopefully a couple more weeks. I don't know what's going to happen, but soon, you can uh, get the protein-based vaccine and hopefully there'll be some, the people who are resident of get, about getting mRNA vaccines will take um, one of the protein ones too, instead. 
So uh, Jafan, and forgive me if I mispronounce that, is asking about what measures and characteristics other than a fatality rate do we look at in order to con uh, conclude that a variant is, um, you know, better or worse, worse than the flu, different aspects? So, I mean, all of the, so one of the, the I mean, the variants are, the, the way we see the variants is that we're sequencing viruses all the time. Um, I think it's about 1% or so of the viruses in the United States are sequenced of positive cases. Uh, in the UK and other countries, a little bit more, somewhere in the 5 to 10% range. Um, but the variants you basically see because they are, they're emerging and you see them by sequencing. So if you're only sequencing one out of 100, they have to be a large number of them to rise up um, in the background of what's currently there. And when, you know, for a case for Omicron, we, we saw it emerge, or you know, the scientists who work on the genome sides of this, saw it emerge remarkably rapidly. Um, and it was kind of a, um, it was certainly a big um, uh, eye-opening event that something like this could, a variant could spread as rapidly as it could, um, as we saw Omicron did, and just take over Delta, which we thought was kind of remarkably transmissible as it was, and would be the end all be all of where we were for a while. So again, no one knows what they're doing. So it's okay to not know the answers to these things. Um, uh, but as we go to more variants, I mean, certainly hospitalizations are important. Case numbers are important. You know, people being sick um, are the numbers that we, that I personally watch is looking at hospitalization numbers in the area um, and, and following those to see how, if, if we know a variant is emerging, but is it not putting people in the hospital, then, um, you know, we're approaching the, the, the time when it becomes a cold. Uh, we're not there. The hospitals are still pretty stocked with cases, um, not as bad as they have been in previous uh, surges, but it's there. It's still not an easy thing to handle in hospitals. Um, so th those are the parameters that we look at, you know, in, in our case. So uh, Natalie, it appears, is inspired by the work that you do, uh, as I'm sure many other audience members are, uh, and is pursuing an MPH in epidemiologist in epidemiology. Wants to know how uh, how to get your job? <laughs> Good question. You can have it, please. Um, uh, so if you want to be a virologist or a microbiologist in, in you know, what we do, um, so I, my, under, you know, my undergrad degree was in biology. Uh, I went to, I went to got a PhD in, not in virology at all. I was in molecular biology, worked on yeast for my PhD. Um, and just built all of the kind of experience that I had along the way. And then I switched into viruses kind of serendipitously in 2004 when I finished my PhD. Um, so you have to go through all those steps to go to you know, undergrad and get a PhD. Um, I did a postdoc at UNC working on in coronaviruses and then uh, someone hired me here in Maryland um, and I've been here ever since. So uh, you, you know, getting an MPH is great. Uh, you know, we, we need a lot more public health officials uh, in the wild and, and doing the job. I, I don't know if you want my job. I, I think that doing the public health side of this and being public health officers in state health departments or government health departments is incredibly critical. Um, we've had a big wipe out of a lot of those professionals and longtime professionals over uh, this COVID epidemic because of all kinds of politics and other reasons. Um, and just and and realizing that maybe they weren't being respected and and protected as much as they should be. Um, but basically that's, you know, the way my job developed over the years. So uh, S. Morgan has a slightly related question, I think, to that and wants to know lessons learned in public communication around public health for, you know, the next pandemic or the next public health emergency. What do you think are some of the lessons learned over the last couple of years? No, if we have enough time. Um, uh, <laughs> I, I think overall we have a remarkable um, it's been a remarkable emergence. I think everyone realizes this, I would hope, think on this call at least, in you know, anti-science rhetoric and distrust of, of people who know what they're talking about. So I wish that people would have listened to the people who knew what they were talking about early on. And I think that we would be in a different place uh, now if that would have occurred. Um, we had a lot of fancy, you know, fantastical talk about it going away. And, and uh, when you know the people who had worked on these viruses, people like Dr. Nancy Messonnier, at CDC, were saying like, this is, this is a big deal and we need to pay attention for it. And um, I hope that the next time this happens, uh, and there will be a next time, I don't know, it won't be hopefully not two years from now, but hopefully, but, but it will happen. Um, we've learned some of that lesson that, 
that public health officials have to be trusted and believe that we have to get on these things early, that we have to um, you know, not be as selfish as part of this outbreak, I think, as we saw. Uh, and other countries have done well, other countries have done really poorly. And I think that we, you know, there'll, be, there'll be many books and theses from you know, public uh, MPH uh, um, students over the years trying to answer exactly what the right you know, playbook, if you will, we should follow later. Um, but testing, detection, you know, vaccines and drugs and funding and, and basic science research behind these things. Uh, you know, we have a list of things that we should be worried about in the future for viruses and bacteria. And uh, I hope that this has certainly stemmed the idea that we need to um, you know, look at those things now uh, before, before it comes, the next one comes. Um, so Kathy wants to know, uh if there are genetic markers around uh, people who are immune to COVID. And that also makes me wonder, are there people or animals out there that are just entirely immune to the whole class of coronaviruses? Cool. So there are, all right, so for the sec, I'll ask the second one first. The first one up for the animals, there are certainly animals that cannot be infected by this virus. Um, and the reason is because uh, that those little lollipop things behind you on the outside of that virus, they have to bind to the cells to uh, get in. And so they bind to a protein on the surface of cells. And if that protein called, uh, called ACE2 um, doesn't bind to that spike, then you, the virus can't get into cells. And so there are certainly animals that uh, have an ACE2 that the spike doesn't bind. And so you can't get, they don't get infected. So that's, uh, we know that now, we know that, that um, there, there are certainly animals that are more susceptible to, other, to the virus. So like deer seem to be remarkably susceptible. Um, mink are one of them. Um, another that, that really get respiratory viruses very easily. And, and I don't think I would have expected deer to be in that list, but it certainly is. Um, for the human side of this, uh, there are a lot, of, there are certainly genetic studies going on now where people are looking to see what markers are there for people who are um, highly susceptible, not protected. It's hard to see if someone's really protected, um, but for being susceptible. And so there are um, a handful of, of genes that people are, you know, that right now they're just associations, but that are, that are people looking at to look to see if they are um, more susceptible to this virus. Um, some of them are immune genes. So people having unrecognized immune deficiencies that this virus is now um, uh, triggering or at least putting light on. Um, other genes that allow for kind of weaker repair in the lungs. So when you get damage and you don't get very good repair, um, normal infections are protected fine, but these, but SARS-2 is not. So you get kind of this, um, uh, this spotlight effect on those kind of patients. Um, there's also a lot of autoimmunity that has been driven by this virus too. And um, uh, people who have unrecognized autoimmunity to basically the, the response the virus induces in us, um, and uh, those normally those proteins is called interferons are protective. And if your body then recognizes those interferons, those proteins as, as bad, then they make antibodies to them, they clear them out and now the virus kind of has free reign. And so those people are more susceptible. So, you know, we can go both ways looking at, at protection and susceptibility, um, but uh, there hasn't been any genetic loci that I know of that are really proven to be to totally resistant yet, um, uh, especially on the receptor side. So uh, Norman uh, is asking about the, uh, the theory that this uh, virus may have been engineered by people versus, uh, you know, uh, occurred naturally. Do you have any sense of, of what evidence either way there is for that? So there's, there, there's evidence is lacking, I think, on both sides of this equation. Um, all other coronaviruses have been zoonotic viruses. They've jumped from animals to people. Um, all of the real data so far shows that this virus jumps from animals to people uh, through these market events or um, these kind of jackpot events where a bat and a human or a bat infected an animal, an animal jumped to, uh, the virus jumped from animal to humans. I, I, don't, I don't see anywhere in any of the data that's out there um, and I think I've seen almost all of it, I can, that there's any evidence that it's not that. Um, there's a lot of theories and a lot of conspiracy on the out other side of this that it was engineered. It's all conjecture and at the moment. And, and 
Um, all of the evidence certainly points to there being an animal to human jump and this virus being a natural mother nature creation. Um, is there any relationship between uh, the, these viruses or coronaviruses in general, uh, their contagiousness and their lethality? Uh, and I think as an add on to that, is there any reason to believe that they become more benign, the more endemic they get? No, great. So there's, um, there's no evidence that as viruses spread more and more and more, they get milder. Um, that's, uh, it's only a theory, but it's not really been proven out. Um, the, uh, the idea that the, so what was the first part? Sorry, I was focusing on the second part. So I was asking, uh, or the question was around uh, lethality. Oh, versus lethality, right. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, I was trying to think about the second the second first. So, um, so, that's, that it's, so there's a lot of parameters of the virus. So all the virus cares about, if you think of anthrop anthropomorphizing it, that its fitness is driven by how many people it can infect. So if, if a virus doesn't transmit well, you're never going to see it um, in most places, most cases. Um, and so the better a virus transmits, the more people it can infect, the more uh, spread it can have. Uh, if your host gets really sick before you can infect, before you can transmit, then it's not good for a virus. Um, uh, and so there's certainly limitations on that as uh, on the viruses side of things, on the fitness side, that you know, you've, the, every virus evolves its own way of doing this and, and um, you know, as part of its virus family and the, the biology of that virus family. Um, uh, well, SARS-1 infected very well, transmitted very well, but people got really sick early on. And so there was limited spread because you recognized that you were sick as just a, a human response. That's certainly different than what we're seeing for uh, SARS coronavirus 2. Um, and so they're, they're, they're related, but they're pretty independent biology behind transmission, lethality, um, uh, kinetics of replication, host response, all of these are kind of they're somewhat intertwined, but they're pretty unique responses that the virus has kind of Goldilocks its way through depending on the virus family. So um, I think we have time for maybe one more question kind of on the quick side, if possible. Uh, Jillian is asking about future vaccines uh, versus current vaccines, specifically with reference to uh, T cell response, how that yes. might be different. But I mean, looking forward and just trying to find as the, we sort of talked about earlier in this event, one vaccine to cure them all. You know, what, are, what would you say the most promising technology is for you? So I, the mRNA vaccines are, are remarkably potent. And I think that they're flexible and used in a lot of spaces. Um, I think what we've seen from the protein vaccines is that they may have better protection across more variants than the mRNA vaccines. And so, um, the, the really the future proof that, you know, the short version of this is that um, uh, the more we understand about what the, resp the, human, the immune response is to different parts of the vaccine, we can then use just those little parts by themselves and then multiplex them together. And so I think what we'll see in the future are these multiplexed versions of the same vaccine, um, whether it's combining multiple vaccines together, like we do for flu and you put four different strains together, whether it's putting the same, uh, you know, different sequences, but the same spike in a, in a row. Um, you know, I think both of those are, are really uh, reasonable options where the kind of next phase of this uh, vaccination goes. Well, unfortunately, that's all we have time for in this segment. Uh, a lot of you are, have also signed up for our VIP section. So if you, uh, you can click over to that link in just a second. Matt, thank you so much for uh, what was a, a great talk and a great discussion as always. I know a lot of our questions were specific to the current coronavirus and not so much some of the other stuff, but um, thank you for answering as many as we could get to. We had over 50. Thank you to the audience for all of your questions as well. Um, Anne? Yeah, well, of course, I just add my thanks to Rick's. And uh, as always, we hope this is not the last time we can nab you. Um, we just hope that the next time is in real life and that we can do it as a live event. Um, so we'll, we'll keep our fingers crossed anyway. But of course, 
next time, come back for our event, um, Eat, Drink, and Be Healthy, I think it's called, uh, with Walter Willett and, and our good friend, Oz Scott. So look for that invitation in your inboxes. Uh, Sachi will make sure it arrives in plenty of time and sign up and we'll see you there. Thanks, everybody. Bye.